Hey, good afternoon, Facebook world. Welcome to another episode of Track Live. I'm Greg Summer, co-founder, also chief scientific officer at Track Fertility. Measure, track, and improve your reproductive health at home. That's what we do here at Track. We're doing these series to help men understand anything and everything about men's reproductive health. Lots of questions. This is your chance to, to write it in. We bring in experts. We have a, a phenomenal expert and guest today. But first, I wanted to mention some very exciting news that we had here very recently at Track. If you're at your newsstand, pick up the latest issue of Men's Health, September 2017. It's got Ryan Reynolds right there on the cover. The Track Male Fertility System named the number one new at-home health test by Men's Health Magazine. Huge boost for us, huge recognition, big thanks to Men's Health, and even more so a big thanks to all of you out there who are using the product, um, tracking your sperm count, taking steps to get healthier, showing that we're on to something. We're building a movement, and it's very exciting for us to, to be a part of it. So with that said, I'm going to bring in my guest today, Mr. Ryan Reynolds. No, I'm kidding. We're joined today by Dr. Natan Barhama, a urologist, a really a top expert in the space, RMA of New York, also Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Dr. Barhama, thank you so much for joining us here on Track Live. Thank you so much. And again, it's wonderful to see the connection between men's health and, and home testing of fertility. I think that is not a small achievement. It's important to realize that the two are connected and we can get into that in more detail, but to see that out there, the connection being made uh, in such a public fashion is, is important to all of us who are in this field. Oh, thanks so much. And uh, couldn't have said it better myself and I appreciate you saying that. So uh, you and I have known each other for a long time uh, and you know, you're one of really the top experts in the space. You practice in New York City. You, you wear several hats. The audience can see all of the framed diplomas sitting there behind you, but maybe could you take a few minutes and introduce yourself, talk about your practice and your interest areas? Sure. Um, I'm a urologist uh, who self-specialized uh, with fellowship training uh, in male infertility, and uh, I've been in the director of male reproductive medicine at Mount Sinai uh, for the last 20 years. Um, what's most exciting for me uh, is that I am practicing within a fertility environment. Uh, I am not separate from the RMA of New York fertility practice. Uh, I'm in-house, so to speak, uh, and that enables me to really uh, coordinate, collaborate, uh, you know, with my colleagues who focus on the female side, so that when couples come to the practice, uh, we're holistic, we're comprehensive, Everyone is individualized, and we don't have to, to fragment uh, the treatment program. Uh, and uh, over the years, uh, several of my colleagues have adopted that approach. Uh, and I think the benefits uh, to the couple uh, achieving a pregnancy sooner than later uh, in this fashion is, is very rewarding and, and really has made my life uh, very fulfilling. Right. No, that's great. So. You, know, you mentioned that you're you're an in-house urologist at, at RMA of New York, one of the top fertility clinics in the world. Really, a phenomenal institution, very data-driven, very scientific. But that's somewhat of a rare a rare position to have a, a urologist on staff. Maybe describe a little bit about what couples can expect when they when they come to RMA, specifically from the male point of view. Sure, sure. sure. Uh, look, you know. Um, we feel that if there is male factor infertility, uh, the diagnosis is obviously something that is most often picked up by an abnormal semen analysis, and we get it, can get into that uh, and when one needs to establish that fact a little later. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not true that the majority of infertility is, is a female issue. Uh, in about 30 to 40 percent of the time, there is a male factor component. Um, what has really been a phenomenal advance in medicine over the last 15 years or more, but really in the last 15 years, is how um, intracytoplasmic, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, advances in pre-implantation, genetic diagnosis, all that has enabled us to become more effective in overcoming low sperm counts. So basically a poor sperm count is not an obstacle to moving forward with assisted reproductive technologies. But having said that, something is underlying the pathology. It is still a condition that is termed a disease. 
And it's not normal to have subfertility. And so well, the question is, is how when the couple comes in, do we not just overcome the problem, but try to understand what's causing it, finding factors and influences that can improve it and hopefully improve one's individual health as well? Yeah. So you talked about there's some underlying things going on. There's a lot of a lot of press, a lot of awareness around what's been coined a, a major decline in sperm counts and actually been published by some of your colleagues there at, at Mount Sinai, some of the recent, recent press. Mm -hmm. um, and there's alarm bells going off, right? It's uh, alarming for the, the male species, the human species at risk for, for this big decline. What's your perspective? And, and especially, you know, our audience, our customers are are men who are pretty early on in this process. What should young guys be thinking about when they hear big news of the sperm counts are, are plummeting? Well, I, I think it's still controversial. I think this this question is is um, uh, has been raised, and and one can assume that the data does strongly suggest that there is a decline in the sperm count. But what I think is is important is us as individuals, you know, as a male who's trying to have a child, or if uh, a couple is having difficulty, um, or how we pick up male factor infertility, we have to take it much more seriously, meaning that the assumption that the uh, that one's fertility is intact is not an assumption that one should make. So if there is a global decline, how does that affect me as an individual? And for that, it's important to have uh, the evidence of what's going on in your specific situation. And um, it's just, you know, to me, it's very difficult to see you know, a couple trying for six months, a year, um, and, and, and maybe the woman's cycle is a little irregular. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, all that time and emotional drain and stress could have been limited by understanding that there was an underlying male factor. And all that was missing was to take that step of getting a test. Right. And that test is, is critical. And, um, and I'll tell you that that test can be life saving. I, you know, I, I don't want to get it to be to be melodramatic, but you know, I saw thirty patients today. Okay, and I'll just give you an example of my third patient. Okay, this is an individual. They've been trying for two years. His sperm count initially back in, in you know uh, about a year and a half ago was was okay, uh, but a repeat showed a dramatic drop. Um, and they have not been successful. And uh, the f female specialist could easily have just moved forward and done IVF. But he said, you know, there's a change here. There's this drop in sperm count doesn't make, it, it isn't expected. And the question is why? Hmm. So he came to me this morning and, and he was reluctant. He, he was a busy executive. He you know, needed to take time out from work. Um, wanted to know when this was going to be done with and, and how soon can you get out of the office because that's, that's you know, men are very busy. And um, after exam, you know, I realized he had testicular cancer. Wow. Okay? This person came in thinking he was just going to, you know, come in and out of my office. And at the end of the day, it was clear that there was a mass. He noticed it. He didn't pay attention to it. And, um, you know, We'll have to see where this goes. I'll do the diagnostic workup and the CAT scans and the surgery, and and I'm hopeful that you know, uh, you know, he doesn't have metastatic disease, and and we can preserve his fertility. But this is a you know, this is why a declining sperm count or one's abnormal semen analysis should not be taken for granted. And and I'm great giving you you know an exceptional case, but one that I just encountered you know a couple hours ago. And it's important for men to realize that, you know, semen parameters and fertility is a window to one's health. And yes, the most extreme case can be cancer, but there are other conditions, infections, uh, hormonal issues, uh, a result of bad lifestyle, you know, smoking, uh, opioid abuse, uh, alcohol. These are all, you know, lack of exercise. These are all contributing variables that have implications way beyond one's fertility. Mm. 
but I mean, you mentioned it's exceptional, but you know, this is probably the first time we're talking about testicular cancer here on, on this series. So is it true then that a low sperm count, uh, uh, an abnormal seed analysis is, is linked to higher rates of, of cancer? Absolutely. Uh, low sperm counts are increased one's risk of having testicular cancer. Now you have to understand what is testicular cancer. Testicular cancer is the number one cancer for young, younger men. Okay, it is just, that's it. It is the, the cancer. When men get older, you know, prostate cancer obviously is more of an issue. But for younger men, men in their reproductive, you know, age, testicular cancer is the number one cancer. The majority, over 90% of testicular cancer are called germ cell tumors. What are germ cell tumors? Germ cells are the sper the same cells that make sperm. It's not, you know, it's not a, an association. It's, it's, it's the same cell that can either make sperm or make or result in testicular cancer. So a declining sperm count or low sperm count uh, is something that should be taken seriously. And, and the, today's case was a perfect example of, of, of that uh, situation. So besides semen analysis and getting checked, I mean, obviously that's one of the, the simpler things you could do, but I also think that there's a, a big problem with men not understanding the guidelines or recommendations, especially young men that we're talking about. Um, you know, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of mixed signals about when do you check? You mentioned he, he noticed a mass and ignored it. Well, how often should you be checking for this mass? What are you supposed to do? What do you advise young guys who, you know, Really Look, testicular cancer, fortunately, is one of those cancers that if it's picked up early, surgical treatment is definitive, okay? It's unlikely to be life-threatening. Um, uh, and in the more serious cases, there are treatments, but the key here is to pick it up early and then right. the treatment is extremely effective. Yeah. So. Men should be comfortable examining their testicles if there is, and get a sense of what, what is baseline. Right. You know, in medicine, you have a baseline and then you have an abnormal finding. And if there's a change, it doesn't have to be painful, but if there's a change, a lump, an induration, anything that is abnormal, you just go to the physician, go to the doctor, have an expert examine it, do an ultrasound, and establish whether there's something going on. You know, men, in general, view healthcare very differently than women. You know, women, you know, have changes that require medical care, you know, and then there's periods of time when they want to avoid getting pregnant. And then right. there's periods of time where they want to get pregnant. And each of those uh, involves going for a, uh, an evaluation and a checkup. You know, I mean, men, you know, if you play basketball and you sprain your ankle, you'll go to the doctor or if you need to. Or if you, like me, if you have a skiing injury, you know, you need to have surgery because, you know, that's it. You, you hurt yourself skiing. But otherwise, why would you go to the doctor? You know, right. There's just no real motivation. Uh, but we pay, the, we pay the price for that, whereby we tend to be deniers and, and we are, um, you know, not comfortable in the medical setting. And often uh, push off uh, life-saving screening tools or uh, evaluations that are important. And fertility and achieving a family is one of those goals that if you do have that, you have to overcome that mindset because you owe it to your partner to know where you are, what's, what are you bringing to the table, can you improve it, uh, can you optimize things, because there's a big difference in terms of conceiving naturally or doing inseminations or having to use these advanced technologies. Just because they're there doesn't make it easier for your partner. Yeah, I have more questions. But, you know, again, remind the audience to, if you have questions, write in Dr. Barhama is one of the, the top file leaders and he tells it like it is. So I encourage you to, to ask anything that's on your mind. Um, do you think it's getting better? You've been, you've been practicing for a while. Do you see a change in how the, the receptivity or openness of young men to, to getting checked, getting evaluated, and doing something about it? Unfortunately, no. no. Unfortunately, I don't. I think that um, uh, what motivates most men uh, to assess their fertility 
uh, is when um, you know their partner in, is is trying to conceive, and and it's an uncomfortable situation. You know, sex is is not natural. It's timed, and there's a lot of pressure. And I have patients who you know uh, over time that becomes an issue in terms of erectile and, and sexual performance. But at the end of the day, if if you know. Um, the goal, if the goal is to achieve a pregnancy, that is often what motivates uh, an individual uh, either on his own, uh, which is ideal, or because of his partner's insistence that a fertility assessment be done. But it should be done early on. Yeah. You know, I live in a, a city where people delay parenthood because of pursuing uh, careers. Uh, and it's very important to realize that once a woman is 37, her fertility declines. Okay, and if, and and therefore you have to work backwards. You say to yourself, okay, um, we're starting, let's say, at 34. How many kids do we really want? Right. Do we want one? Do we want two? Do we want more than that? Okay, so then you know you really do have. Uh, a time factor, a biological clock effect on the female partner's side that basically, you know, um, warrants or, or, you know, uh, puts, you know, uh, the, you know the, the need to establish the facts and to determine one's fertility is, is very important to do early on. Right. Yeah, we got a few more questions. We'll just take these in order. Um, so first one, I don't know where this person is, but it's been crazy hot here all summer in you know, other countries still to make heat wave. Could that be affecting my sperm count, Dr. Barhama? Look, I think, look, let's, let's talk about this temperature effect. Why, why, why is it even an issue, right? I mean, when you think about it. So the reason is for the following. The, the sperm production has to be, uh, uh, you know, it has to occur in the scrotum where the uh, temperature is about two degrees cooler than body temperature. Right. If testes don't descend and if they're still kept in the body, the individual's sperm count is zero. The germ cells or the sperm cells die. So it's a very, very sensitive system that is dependent on temperature. So many things that increase temperature, okay, um, dilated veins that are filled with blood in a body temperature, uh, sitting in very hot tubs um, can all affect uh, one's fertility. Uh, if someone had, for example, a very bad um, uh, uh, infectious process where their temperature you know, um, was high for several days, that can also have a, an effect on, on sperm production. I'm not convinced that you know the temperatures that was having on the outside yeah. uh, have an effect. The body knows how to cool itself, sure. uh, but direct thermal contact um, and uh, increased body temperatures can have an effect. It's important to realize that you know whether you wear boxers or briefs, it does not matter. Okay, so uh, that's not that is a myth. It has no effect at all and just wear what's comfortable. Got it, got it. Here's another one. The vena has. What does it mean when a seed shows positive fructose? Uh, it's just one of those indicators on a semen analysis that uh, it tells us that the fluid in the semen uh, is coming from the seminal vesicles and the prostate. It's it's, uh, you know, I think it's important to realize what does a semen analysis tell us, okay? And that's, that's important. I mean, the first thing that's important to understand is does someone have a normal sperm concentration, okay? What is your sperm count, okay? And, 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 and that's very important. It is a, an accurate predictor of fertility, uh, and it's something that changes uh, with time if whether one is improving their health or if one's health is declining, it can fluctuate. But the most important parameter uh, on, sper on fertility testing is establishing what is one's sperm count. Uh, the other variables that we use is motility, uh, what percentage of the sperm are moving, and how normal does the sperm look? 
And all that together gives us a picture of one's fertility. But, you know, again, when a couple is trying to conceive and, uh, and they're trying for six months to a year and the person has a semen analysis and the sperm count is zero, you know, uh, that is something that shouldn't have taken a year to, to establish and to understand. And one of the most rewarding, you know, encounters I have in my office is when these patients come in you know, when the uh, sperm count is zero and, and they've been, you know, emotionally, you know, in turmoil and, and distressed for a week or two since those results came in. And on physical exam, you know, one sees that the testes are normal in size. The individual was just simply born without the tube. You know, otherwise he's perfectly healthy. Hormones are fine. And, uh, you know, we can overcome that. You know, naturally, no. Can we get sperm that's usable and, and, and achieve a pregnancy? Absolutely. But we could have done that and established that a year ago, not not at, at that just initial visit. Right. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So we got one more here from uh, Lane says, how can a man's lifestyle choices, diet and exercise affect his fertility? We've been talking about some of these things, but Maybe to, to reframe a little bit, what do you think are the, the biggest things that, you know, especially when it comes to general diet and exercise that, that men should be aware of? Yeah, no, I, I think that's probably um, probably the most important uh, uh, issue and, and, and variable that one can have an influence on. So I think we just have to use common sense, okay? Common sense, you know, implies that if one is watching what they eat, uh, minimizing, you know, uh, uh, diets that that are using processed food, you know, high estrogen content, um, you know, uh, not exercising. I mean, exercise is, is important. Uh, we know that obesity, uh, you know, diminishes one's fertility. Uh, being overweight uh, has a hormonal effect uh, and, and can impair fertility as well. Um, smoking, you know, whether it's cigarettes or, or marijuana, uh, is established as decreasing one's fertility. Um, you know, um, it, it's just important to 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 use common sense, uh, and and things that are not good for your health are not going to be good for your fertility. Right, um, and that's just uh, you know now and the opposite is it is is you can improve your fertility by losing weight, exercising properly, eating properly. I mean, and, and, and holistic approaches. I mean, we use nutraceutical supplements. Uh, we think antioxidants are very important for male fertility. Um, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, when patients come to RMA of New York, I mean, we offer uh, counseling to reduce stress, we offer um, a nutritionist uh, to manage your diet and, and help you, uh, you know, uh, with exercise and, and, and proper diet. Uh, and that's all, uh, we don't charge for that. And the reason we do that is because, you know, the goal is to achieve a pregnancy the most natural way. Uh, and, uh, and we truly believe that if, if one wants to achieve that, emotional stress, uh, diet, exercise, supplements, as well as state-of-the-art science, uh, all put together uh, offers us uh, the outcomes uh, at a, uh, at a, in a comprehensive, tailored, focused approach for that couple. Right, a lot of options, right? These things are, for the mm -hmm. most part, treatable and stuff you can do about it. The sooner you're checked, the, the better your chances of success. Probably a good time for me to plug our, our app Download the track app, it's free. We have a, a pretty extensive questionnaire that'll ask you about things that what are you eating, how much are you exercising, your heat sources, are you smoking, and give you a little bit of feedback on why those could be causing fertility issues and some, some tips on what to do about it. Um, I'm curious, since you're right there in the heart of New York City, right in Manhattan, which is kind of a microcosm of society in some ways, are you seeing any trends that are popping up, things that are really starting to be a problem um you know you mentioned that a lot of a lot of your patients are 
very career focused, you know, driven and, and pushing off pregnancies, but other things that you see um, you know, day to day in your practice? Look, I think, you know, I don't think living in a city is the most uh, ideal uh, environment for exercise or, you know, um, limiting toxin exposure. Um, so I think that one has to be, you know, even more vigilant about being healthy and, 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 um, and you know, not letting one's career uh, take away from, from managing one's diet and, uh, and, and, you know, people entertain at night a lot. So there's alcohol and smoking environments that are just, you know, accepted as part of one's job. But at the end of the day, when you're trying to conceive, you need to take a step back and say, okay, let's make this happen uh, sooner than later. And what am I doing in my day-to-day -day life that I can uh, change? Right. Yeah. And the other thing I like to say is, you know, this is, you're dealing with guys who are preparing to be dads, right? The whole reason they're coming to see you is because they're trying to start their family, to have children. And what, what better time in your life to, to take a high level look at some of the things you're doing? I mean, it, you know, my friends, uh, like, guys just don't live well, period. And the things that men do with, you know, high school, college and beyond with, you know, late nights and partying, like it, it, it pays a toll. And you know, you're kind of wreaking havoc on your, your health and fertility that can catch up with you. So don't, part of that is I think a lot of these messages around eat better, exercise more, stop smoking can kind of be seen as a buzzkill. But I try to position it as you know, this is this is the time in your life to do it, and we're actually not talking about changing things for years, right? And, and that's all good if you can, you know, change, instill some better habits and behaviors. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about a few months to make a big difference, and you know, the earlier you can start those, the better your chances. Look, I, I think that that's a great point. I think that. Um... You know, I think that there's there's two subsets of men. You know, the, the, there's those that all of a sudden, you know, realize that being a dad is a responsibility, and it doesn't end once you've achieved a pregnancy. You know, right. just, uh, you know, do you want to play ball with your son or go to you know, and your daughter and, and, and engage in sports, and or do you want them to, you know, have you walk around with your diabetes and obesity in a wheelchair? Yeah. Uh, so I, I do see a lot of men where the motivation of being a dad, whether trying to be a dad or moving forward as dads, uh, lets them, you know, double down on being healthy. Yeah. Like on their own, it wasn't as important. Well, that's good. I think that's a very positive outcome. I mean, hopefully that, that continues to be true because, you know, guys, we live seven years shorter than women. Like the, let's, uh, let's try to reverse that trend and catch up a little bit. The sooner you, you know, that's a good point. Like for most, for a lot of guys, you know, healthcare doesn't kick in until later in life. I'm talking about things that are, you know, starting to get regular screenings at 50 plus, but we're talking about 20, 25 years earlier, take a little, be a little bit more mindful at this point can really pay dividends down the road. Listen, I think, you know, I, I, you know, I'm being just, you know, throwing out general terms. I think, you know, you get a pass till you're about 25, 30. You know? Okay. <laughs> uh, which may be true, maybe not. But, but at that point, you know, how do you set yourself up for your 50s uh, is a decision you make, you know, and, and you see it all around you. You see the guys who are in their mid 30s and, and 40s who basically, you know, default on being responsible for them, for their health or their, as you know, and, and basically are you know, following one trajectory and those that are basically saying, you know what, I'm going to, you know, ensure that, you know, I may have cardiovascular disease or diabetes in my family. Um, and uh, I saw my father, or, 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 you know, not take care of himself and, and saw the outcome of that. And I don't want that for my, for my child. So, uh, you know, I think that um, having forums like this and, and, and engaging with individuals who have taken different paths uh, is important. Well, and it is a little counterintuitive. You know, you're talking about 
a lot of people think about taking care of others, taking care of your, your spouse and your kid, but mm -hmm. there's really no better way to do that than to take care of yourself first and make sure that you're going to be there to be able to provide. And, um, I think that that is a little bit of a counterintuitive message, but um, yeah. hopefully, yeah. yeah. And it's true for not just your health, it's, you know, this is a time for finances and, mm -hmm. you know, and strategic planning and everything that goes into that. So mm -hmm. it's part of a uh, growing up that um, hopefully we get better at doing. Well, this has been really great and we're about out of time. Any last message, um, last advice for, for guys who might be out there watching thinking, you know, I'm, I'm early on, I, I assume I'm healthy, but I'm just a little interested. What, what would you recommend to that? Guy? Listen, I, I think that assumptions are just what they are, they're assumptions. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, we live in an environment in a time where you can test those assumptions and having an, a, a fact or a confirmation of, of one's fertility or establishing that it's good or it needs to be improved is easier today than it's ever been. And um, again, uh, the, when men make assumptions, very often... Uh, those assumptions turn out to be inaccurate, and we pay a price for that. Well said. Well, for all those watching, thank you. For those who wrote in questions, appreciate it. Others who have questions, feel free to drop it on our Facebook page, Dr. Barhama, and I'll be happy to, to answer them as we go. Um, Dr. Barhama, thank you so much for joining us. Let's do this again sometime. This has been great and, and really helpful. My pleasure. Take care. All right, thanks. Bye.